What's going on, everyone? Welcome to another episode of the Proverbial Life Podcast. This is a podcast where we encourage Christians to look to Christ, live wisely, and leave a legacy behind for generations to follow. So last week I did a video from Woke Preacher Clips. Today I have another one. This one is coming from uh, Austin Channon Brown and Kev on stage. Now I'm just going to give you my personal opinion of these two individuals Uh, I personally do not believe them to be Christians. Uh, I say this on the basis of, number one, reading Austin Channing Brown's book and just seeing the vitriol and uh, hatred that she has toward white people. Um, And, you know, as believers, we're not called to decide who we're going to love in the body of Christ. We're called to love one another. And if your life is not characterized by loving your brother and sister, regardless of the color of their skin, then you probably don't know the Lord because the fruit of your knowing the Lord isn't evident in the life that you live. And so those are my uh, thoughts about her. I also have had some interaction with her on uh, Twitter uh, maybe a year or so ago uh, based on some things that she said. I responded to her and she just kind of cut you off my interactions with her uh very brief they were on twitter and in reading her book and in listening to several of her interviews on the truth table uh this one here with uh kev on stage is that she seems to be excuse me she seems to be very um uh what's the word i'm looking for she seems to be the type of person that it's her way or the highway and it's her when i say her way it it's you see it from her perspective as a black woman because her experience trumps anything you have to say uh or or you're cut off completely cut off there is no open conversation there's no back and forth the question is do you see it from my perspective as a black oppressed woman or not and if you don't then we ain't got nothing else to talk about. That's the kind of the vibe I've gotten from her, um, from the several interactions uh, that I have had with her, either through the engaging of her book, which I will post here. Uh, the title of her book is "I'm Still Here: Black Dignity in a World Made for Whiteness." Uh, I'm going to read some quotes from that book here in a moment. Um, in fact, let me do that now. That way, you all can see what I'm looking at and you know the reason why I'm doing these types of videos is because these are the kinds of ideas that are being embraced by people um, and many of which maybe have never thought through these topics uh, in a biblical way and so when someone comes along with um, answers to a gap in their own minds they'll take anything, uh, which which should never be the case, right? We should always be examining what someone has to say and testing it in light of Scripture. But when you are levying assaults against people because they have less melanin in their skin, and those people who feel guilty because of that don't know how to think through uh, a biblical apologetic on race or ethnicity and unity in Christ, then these are the types of things, these are the types of ideas that they end up eventually embracing. So it's quite tragic, but this is why I want to do these kinds of videos uh, in response to those uh, who, number one, believe them, and then in response to, for the benefit of those who um, are are not sure, they're just kind of in the air. So let me... um, let me share this with you all. So this is this is her book. I'm going to read a couple quotes before I play a video clip um, with her and Kev on stage. Oh, and my thoughts about Kev on stage. Um, I, 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 he seems to me, and I've watched him several years. He's, I guess, a Christian comedian. Uh, he, he doesn't seem to me to be the type of person who um, knows the Lord and his word. And again, I don't know his heart. He, he may very well be a believer. And that isn't for me to make the final decision on. The Lord knows. But I just, I get the, the feeling from him and 
listening to his content, that he doesn't strike me as a man of God. He doesn't strike me as a Christian. He doesn't strike me as somebody who um, loves the Lord, knows the Lord, and has a sense of um, humility before him uh, in regards to proclaiming the Lord and, and, and living in light of that uh, fear of the Lord. Those are my opinions on him. Uh, he hasn't written a book and, you know, any of that sort. But but this podcast where he has uh, Austin Channing Brown on is quite telling of his worldview. And so he seems to me to be the type of person who is uh, has benefited from um, Christianity uh, and has made fun of um, people or the church uh, and has created uh, a... a uh, a market for that worldliness in Christianity. Um, you know, we're told not to love the world or the things of the world. And I just I just get that there is a sense of the love of the world from individuals like him. Again, that's my opinion. Uh, we're all entitled to our opinion, and that's mine concerning Kev on stage. That being said, let me read you a couple quotes here. Um I did read the book, uh, I'm Still Here, Black Dignity in the World Made for Whiteness. Uh, I was quite embarrassed to order it from my local library uh, because, you know, the, the title is, is intentionally offensive um, and it's meant to be in your face. This isn't an extension of an olive branch to say, uh, let's let's do what Paul calls us to do, uh, which is, you know, we have the ministry of reconciliation and we are ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this isn't an olive branch to white people. This is a slamming of white people. This is a slam dunk of white people. And any, any angry person, uh, any person angry toward, hey, let me switch my screen back. Any person angry toward white people, um, any person that has an angst toward white evangelicalism will love this kind of book. In fact, I remember uh, Lecrae being uh, a proponent of this book and and um, praising God for Austin Channing's story. I remember listening to her on Truth Table and them championing this book uh, and and her testimony uh, as as a, as a black woman. Uh, and the oppression that she went through, uh, with with her name, uh, you know, her name being Austin, and why her parents had to name her Austin because she knew they knew that uh, the world wasn't for black people, and if she had a boy's name, then that would give her at least a call, right? The call for the interviews, uh, and and it was quite it was quite saddening to hear that that was the worldview that she was raised in. Uh, I'm, I don't doubt that her parents uh, raised her in such a way to have um, dignity for herself and respect. And and and, and um, see, she seems to be very well educated, at least in her communication. Um, but again, th- this, this idea of vitriol toward people with a less count of melanin in their skin Uh, And she claims to be a follower of Christ. She claims to be a follower of Jesus. And when I read this book, again, it didn't drive me to see the glories of Christ in the gospel. It didn't drive me to the beauty of the doctrine of justification and the reconciliation that we have with God the Father uh, looking upon the son's sacrifice and seeing that is acceptable and on the basis of my turning away from my sin and embracing Christ, uh, then I will be uh, reconciled with God. It didn't drive me to do any of those things. The, this book is the type of book that drives you to greater and greater animosity and hatred toward white people. And it uses one person's experience to encourage you to share your experience all at the expense of white people. And that is simply not the call of Christians that have been blood-bought by 
the Lord Jesus Christ. So with no further ado, let me just read you a couple quotes from this book. And I'm not reading them in any order. This is here on Goodreads. You can uh, go here for yourself and see. But let me read a couple of these. Uh, it says this. This is the first one. When you believe niceness disproves the presence of racism, it's easy to start believing bigotry is rare and that the label racist should be applied only to mean-spirited, intentional acts of discrimination. The problem with this framework, besides being a gross misunderstanding of how racism operates in systems and structures enabled by nice people, is that it obligates me to be nice in return, rather than truthful. I am expected to uh, to come closer to the racist, be nicer to them, coddle them. Now, you, when you listen, the book is filled with those kinds of statements. So, so she's saying the worst kinds of racist and racism are not the you know the ones with the white masks over their head or waving a Trump flag. She's saying that the worst ones are the nice ones because the nice ones are the ones that you are not expecting, right? Uh, these are the ones who are um, uh, maybe give a facade. And you'll see, she talks about this in this audio clip that I'll play here in a moment. Um, she says it's easy to start believing bigotry, uh, um, bigotry uh, is is rare, uh, in that uh, the label racist being applied only to mean spirited, uh, intentional acts of discrimination, uh, and then she uses this uh, Marxist framework. Right? What is the framework? It's this of uh, racism in systems and structures, uh, enabled by nice people. So if you're white and you're nice, you're the worst kind of racist there is. Um, bigotry, excuse me, believing in bigotry, bigotry, <laughs> and bigotry. So, so we see that Austin, she has no clue. She, she, she doesn't understand the gospel. This is another quote, and then we'll play the video clip. White people desperately want to believe that only the lonely, isolated whites only club members are racist. This is why the word racist offends nice white people so deeply. Quote, you know, quote, nice white people. Uh, it challenges their self-identification as good people. Sadly, most white people are more worried about being called racist then about whether or not their actions are in fact racist or harmful. You know what the irony in this whole thing is that she's levying this charge against nice racist white people and shining a magnifying glass on their sin when all the while she's guilty of committing the sin that she's blaming them for. She's the racist. She's the one with hatred in her heart, and it can be proven, right? You can, you can identify, you can pinpoint where the hatred in her heart is at because the words that came out of her mouth. As you read her literature, as you listen to these clips, you can see that this woman hates white people, okay? And that is an evidence that she has not been changed by the power of God because that is the very thing that Christ removes from our hearts when we come to faith in him. He takes away that anger and bitterness toward others and he helps us to love even our enemies. Now, white people should not be our enemies, but even if they were your enemies, you are called by God to love even your enemies. And if they're in Christ, they're not your enemies, regardless of the color of their skin. And yet, Austin Channing Brown and Kev on stage, and I, I, I see again, Kev on stage, he just seems to me to be a person that's like, um, 
you know, looking for clout and looking to uh, be a bandwagon on these types of topics and, uh, you know, just a joke, to be quite honest with you, just a flat out joke. Um, well, no further ado, let me switch over to this video. Uh, if you have not seen this, um, prepare yourself because it is quite disturbing and, um, you know, these are the kinds of people that we need to be praying for. We need to be praying that the Lord would humble Austin Channing Brown. And we need to pray that God would raise up people in her life to tell her the truth about her sin. Right? This is the problem when you elevate a person's skin color over the truth. Because now th their skin color dictates reality. And that isn't what dictates reality. The truth of God's word is what dictates reality. This right here is what dictates reality. And so what Austin Channing Brown really needs is a loving brother and or sister to come alongside of her, preferably for her sake, someone who isn't white, to come alongside her and to give her the gospel is to call her out on her sin, is to, you know, the, the sin of slander, slandering your white brothers and sisters, slandering them. These are specific sins that need to be called out. But I don't know if that's going to happen. I'm sure it has. But again, if it has happened, it's very easy for her and others to go on these broadcasts, these live videos and say, you know, they're going to try to check me when they don't even know. They don't know what it's like and just use her experience to trumpet the word of God as her final truth, as her truth. So no further ado, let me just get right into this. There is really a lot to cover in here. And uh, but I, I want you all to hear this for yourself. Listen to this. You talk uh, about being special, right, or or white people, the nice white people and how you have to kind of like coddle them even though they may also be harmful the thought of them realizing that was too much talk to us a little bit about that harmful nice white people what kind of language is this again th this isn't the kind of language that a christian would adhere to and i'm sorry if i have austin channing brown on my podcast you better believe that she's going to be checked. But as you see on Kevin's face and with the question, he obviously is supportive of this book. Otherwise, he wouldn't have had her on. Um, and he obviously doesn't have any, um, you know, um, anything to say negatively about her work. And and so so he he's guilty of believing the same ideas that she's promoting and she has promoted it in a book. So, so th again, these aren't the words and the ideas and uh, the actions of people who love the Lord our God. These are not the actions of Christians. So I had this one work retreat. <laughs> <laughs> this one work retreat. And I don't know why white people love to be out in the middle of no man's land. Mm -hmm. It was out in the middle of no man's land, Kev. See now, just reverse this. You know what? Wh what if you? What if you said? What? If, what if two white people were gathered together on a podcast and they said, "You know, I don't know why why black people always love to eat fried chicken. I I just don't get it. They they just love their fried chicken. I mean, what? Isn't that something? And and chitlins? Are you kidding me? Isn't that something? I mean." this would be the end of the world. I mean, these people would have been canceled as soon as the words came out of their mouths, right? The the YouTube and uh, Google bots would have picked that right up and would have completely canceled them on the spot. But it's okay for these ideas to be communicated from someone like Austin and Kev because of the color of their skin. Because truth doesn't matter. Their experience matters. 
and we went on this boat. I almost got sick on the boat. Uh oh. Because I don't know nothing about boats, Kev. My body don't know nothing about no boat. Okay. And 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 so again, the 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 picture she's painting here is that white people are just almost alien like. They're just strange. They're just weird. And white people do the craziest thing. And again, if that's your thought, that's one thing. But if you profess to be a Christian and you verbalize this, that's a whole nother thing. You know, we, we have sinful thoughts and ideas about different people, some within our own ethnic background, some that that aren't in our ethnic background. We have prejudices that come to mind and 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 false ideas that spring to mind about people or or if we don't have them, we've had them, right? And, and we need to resist them. We need to not verbalize them and not verbalizing them in a way that's um, in agreement with them or okaying them or parading them or promoting those ideas. But here, you just have this continual onslaught and mitigating and minimizing and, uh, you know, exposing of white people. It's hatred in our heart. And every time I have to get on one, my body be like, why is you on a boat? Right. When there's perfectly good, good land for you to be standing on. So I was trying not to get nauseous, but we finally ended the little boat trip. Um, and some people like had to use the bathroom. So we just went to the nearest bar so that folks could go to the bathroom and so I could get a Coca-Cola. And um, my supervisor walks in behind me and she looks around and she goes, Austin, are you okay? And I'm like, well, I'm nauseous. <laughs> <laughs> like if you could go get that Coke, that would be great, right? And yeah. she was she was like, she was like, no, I mean, I mean, you're the you're the only black person here. Now, again, this is he say, she say. It, it, it's hard for me to believe her testimony uh, on her experience here when she's lied about so much in her book, right? I mean, she, she's lied about white people. She's miscategorized them, uh, you know, placing them in a nice white category, Um and then she she she's lied about brothers and sisters in the Lord uh, in her book that uh, she she has white people in a completely other category uh, than than people of color. And so, you know, maybe that's what happened. I, I doubt it. Maybe. Right. Um, but but again, in her telling of the story, you already know that. However, she represents white people is going to be in the worst possible light. So it's hard for me to take what she's saying about this woman's testimony truthfully, because I don't know if she's lying to me again. And Kev, part of me wanted, first of all, I gotta be honest, part of me wanted to be like, oh, you get a gold star for noticing that. But the other part for me was like, woman, I was also the only black person on the boat. I was the only, I was the only black person in the conference room we just came out of. I was the only black person in the van we rode up here in. Like, why do you think you're special? <laughs> why, why do you think being the only black person around you is different from being the only black person in this here bar? Why? Yeah, so this is this is again another thing is here is that we're seeing her bear false witness, uh, and the reason I say that is what she's accusing this white woman of is this white woman wants to she, she her interpretation of this event if it's accurate is that this white woman is trying to position herself as an ally. Uh, and, and I believe it's in her book. Uh, if not, I've heard others uh, of the woke crowd say that you don't get to choose. If you're white, you don't get to choose if you, you're an ally. 
You get to position yourself for the potential of being an ally, but we're the ones who choose whether or not you can be an ally for us. And this is the thing. The woke gospel is ever-changing, right? Their, their understanding of justification is ever-shifting. It isn't based on the finished work of Christ. It's based on their acceptance of your most current sacrifice. It's an ongoing sacrifice that needs to be made and evaluated by the woke priests. And only upon their approval are you accepted. But that acceptance is very similar to the Old Testament sacrificial system. You have to do it once a year, right? And that's the beauty of the new covenant is that it is the once for all finished work of Christ. And so in this new gospel, they want you to bring perpetual sacrifices. They want you to keep bringing sacrifices and you are never, ever seen right before the woke crowd. You are always having to make it right. And it's even more problematic because this isn't a once a year sacrifice. This is a daily, monthly, weekly, hourly sacrifice. Okay? Hourly sacrifice. And your works are being examined. And if your works do not meet the expectation of the woke priesthood, then you are cut off. You are sent outside of the camp. It is quite troubling to see and to hear these things, but let me let her finish. Hey, tell me why, why? It's because you think you special. Jake, you ain't special. Right, but those are the dangerous ones because if I look at her, Mm -hmm. And I say that, right? If I say, did you notice that I was also the only black person in the conference room? Then she gonna get attitude, right? See now, th this is what bugs me with Kev. He, what a coward! What a coward! You know what I'm saying? Like, yo, be a man, bro. Like, call her out. Nah, come on, Austin. Like it, but you know what? He believes it. He believes it. He believes this, and he believes it not on the basis of real hatred and racism. He believes it on the basis of the new definition of racism. He believes it, and she believes it, and, other, and, and, and these other woke proponents believe it on the basis of how someone made me feel, microaggressions. Eric Mason talked about that in his book, Woke Church. Microaggressions. I, I walk into a store and they don't pay me no attention. It's a microaggression. Uh, or I walk into a store and they're on top of me. It's a microaggression. You see, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Either way, white people are going to be seen as racist. And this is anti-Christian. I'm supposed, supposed to be grateful, grateful that I'm the only one in the conference room. room. Yeah, yeah. Right? That's, That's supposed to be indicative of how special I am. Mm -hmm. And if I say to her, I'm just as uncomfortable in the conference room as I am in this here bar. Yeah. Now I'm now I'm saying something about her, and she know it, and she know it, Kev. But I'm different, Austin. It's me. I'm not like them. I'm not, I don't have a Confederate flag. You know what I mean? Like, it'd be like, girl, we listen. I don't, and the thing that I thought was most like that. <laughs> Again, here we go with the, uh, you know, I don't have a Confederate flag. Like, like having a Confederate flag, um, you know, means you're racist, you know, uh, the, the, or, or supporting Trump or, you, you name it, whatever, whatever other categories they have. Um, it, it isn't hatred towards someone that, that is racist. It's microaggressions. It's, um, you know, it's um, the, the color of your skin plus power, right? 
Uh, that that's what that's what makes you racist. When when in turn they are revealing their own hatred in their hearts toward white people and their own racism in their own hearts. It hit home the most is you did it. You <laughs> didn't check her, right? Because you knew now you're just gonna make you're gonna make it even worse for you and myself. Home. Right? Exactly. So sometimes I think white people be thinking like that we are deciding whether or not to give them grace based on whether or not we like have hope in them or something. Like, no, no, we try to figure out <laughs> what is the easiest route for me. You just heard it. It's about me. This is the me religion, y'all. This is the me religion. This isn't about extending grace. This isn't about um, reconciliation. This isn't about working things out. This isn't about understanding one another. This is about what works best for me. And rather than try to educate you again, white people, as if white people need educating on these matters, again, we're not talking about their definition of racist white people is, is white people in general, right? It's just because you're white, you're racist. Um, but, but the Bible's definition is partiality, right? So, so favoring someone, showing more favor to someone based on externals. And, and James chapter two says that you are not to show partiality based on externals. So, so th that, that's racism, right? But, but, but their definition is contrary to the word of God because the word of God is not their authority. And that would be fine if they did not claim to be Christians. And so I, th I think the danger is that these types of people speak under the banner of being in Christ and they deceive people into thinking, well, I can be in Christ and have this animosity and angst and hatred and bitterness against white people. That's the kind of religion I want to take. That's the kind of religion I need. You know, I, I used to think this way when I was an unbeliever. I, I didn't like white people when I was an unbeliever. Uh, I, I saw them as being um, racist. Uh, I saw them as being people in power who wanted to, you know, oppress people of color. And I believe this narrative as an unbeliever. And I came to Christ and the Lord freed me from that. And then I got trapped into this woke movement for several years. And I went right back to the thinking that I was involved in prior to being in Christ. The only difference is now I have Christ. So it's Jesus plus something else. And by the Lord's grace and his kindness, he freed me once and for all, I pray, from this type of ethnic deception. Uh, um, deception. Th these people have blinders over their eyes. And, and, and I can sympathize with that because I was there. And by the grace of God, he freed me. He didn't allow me to be blinded for too long. And now, by the grace of God, my desire, my heart's desire is to speak out against this false teaching, this false representation of Christ, this, this bearing false witness against brothers and sisters, this, this slandering and blasphemous, uh, uh, slanderous actions toward brothers and sisters. Kev, I can't get left by the bus. In the middle of no man's land, I need a ride home. You literally can't get left on the bus. I can't get left. Okay. Now you turn an ally into an enemy, and and you know, in her mind, she's an ally, and she may have that you know potential. But you hear that? She may have that potential. That's what I was talking about earlier. You you don't get to say you're an ally. You get to fill out an application, send it in, and we'll evaluate that application and we'll get back to you, sweetie. Because you may or may not have the potential to be an ally. This isn't 
This isn't Christianity. And you wonder why the charges levied against these ideas are called Marxist, right? You, you wonder why we talk about CRT and we talk about wokeness being a cult because this is an entirely different religion. This is not Christianity. This is not the Christianity of the Bible. If, if, if this would have been prevalent in the early church and it would have gone, it would never have gone unchecked by the apostles and the writers of the New Testament. Never. Not even in the first century. It would never have gone unchecked. It would not have. But you imagine if the body of Christ embraced these ideas. Where would we be? This would lead us to syncretism. This would lead us to uh, people kind of having their own versions of Christianity and embracing, uh, you know, lies, right? This is already a lie, but lies beget more lies. If there isn't a standard of truth that we can examine what people say and test their words in light of Scripture, then it's just chaos. And that's exactly what this is. Nothing but chaos. These people are going to end up on an island by themselves with everyone that believes like them. And then they'll find out that the problem wasn't white people. The problem was their hearts. You see, this is the thing. If these kinds of people, these kinds of people being anyone who embraces these ideologies, this worldview, if these kinds of people had it their way, they would be completely isolated from white people. Or white people would be their slaves or their dogs, right? And it doesn't have to be literal. It could be, you know, figuratively. But the problem is, is that when white people are subservient to people of color and when they just shut up and listen and or when they're completely uh, exited from their presence and you have all people of color together in this utopian world, guess what? you still are not going to be able to escape the depravity of your own heart. And that will, again, remind you that white people are not the problem. You are the problem. But, girl, you, you, you was white, too. too. Right? Like, I honestly didn't even realize how many microaggressions. This is a newer term for me. I don't pretend to be a scholar. Yeah. Microaggression and scholar? <laughs> oh man see you have no idea what you're talking about you you have you, you're absolutely clueless you know so yeah let, let me let him continue that you especially, especially for, for black, black women, women this is even, even worse for, 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 for black, black women than it is for black men that you have to deal with like daily the ones, ones you don't, don't even like, like you're so you like, like can, can I, I touch, touch your hair, hair is a bigger one, one right? right it's, it's not, not always those overt ones, ones. Yeah. it's smaller yeah. things that yeah. just kind of like build up over time and you're like okay. realize you're gritting your teeth all see these this is another thing right can i can i touch your hair um you know th th there's there's nothing racist about that Unless the person who wants to touch your hair is being racist. And, and you know, but, but the general statement that touching, you know, can I touch your hair is a microaggression. It, it's just lying. It's, it's just a flat out lie. And this is what I mean. People are just making stuff up. Um, let, let me read to you what a microaggression is. Uh, microaggression is uh, a comment or action that subtly and often unconsciously or unintentionally expresses a prejudice, a prejudiced attitude toward a member of a marginalized group, such as a racial minority. This is a complete hocus pocus word and definition. This is this is a word made up for ethnic snowflakes. Right. People who are just so fragile and so weak that, you know, they, they, they can't 
handle anything. And so when you live in a society that functions in that way, then you can't say anything because everything is offensive. And so, you know, I, I want to bridge a gap in, I guess, the racial conflict we have. I'm thinking as a white person, but I'm afraid to open my mouth because every time I do, I say something that is offensive, insensitive. I mean, you can't function in life walking on eggshells and, and or walking a, 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 the tightrope, right? And so you have here, uh, you know, the, the, the request of can I touch your hair, that being a microaggression, consciously or unconsciously, intentionally or unintentionally. It's like, again, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. I can't do nothing right. I can't say nothing right. So what's going to happen? Then we distance ourselves from one another. And now, see, white people just always want to distance themselves. And again, you cannot win. That's right. You know what I mean? And you're, right. you're working in a church, right? You're not in the... You're yeah. in a church. Like talk well, most of my experiences are are connected to the church. So there, it's some sort of faith based initiative. Oh, uh, there are so very few places have, I've had just, that work. I'm sorry, I was talking all over you. No, no, I was just saying that most of my experiences have been faith based. So was that harder because in addition to whiteness, you have you have Jesus Listen. often, and, and you know what? You're upset. Let's pray. Mother. Uh, have. Let me move close to this right here is disturbing. Y'all pray for her. You pray for Kev. They have absolutely no idea what they're talking about. And yet what they're talking about is couched in their experience. And so what audacity do you have, Edwin, to say that she doesn't know what she's talking about? She's talking about her experience. Well, yeah, she's talking about her experience in La La Land. This La La Land. God's world functions on his truths and they based on reality. Reality is based on truth. These microaggressions and these, again, and the problem is, is that, yes, racism exists. And because racism exists, these kinds of testimonials and these kinds of experiences actually diminish real racism. You see? Th these kinds of fabricated, made up ethnic snowflakes share their story and write books and, and create terms like microaggressions and whiteness and white fragility. And all the while, all the while, real ethnic hatred and racism take place and they're minimized or overlooked and not believed because of these kinds of stories but i want you to hear this listen to this to this camera and let me tell you how many how many prayers i have had to endure that were not that were not i repeat about changing the system right about changing the policy wow. right but that were like lord please give austin a heart filled with grace what wow Wow. My friends, Austin Channing Brown is not a Christian. She's not. And I hope I'm wrong. God knows whether or not that statement is true. But I don't see how she could be. Again, the Lord is very patient and the Lord is very kind. And it may be that he's allowing her to see the depravity of her heart in a unique way as she lives in this fog. And I do pray that the Lord would free her as he freed me. But my friends, those people that were praying for you to be gracious, you missed it. You missed the opportunity, Austin, to repent to examine your heart, to, to stop long enough and listen to the word of God 
through the people of God, regardless of the color of their skin, pouring out their heart for you in prayer. You missed it. You missed it by by taking offense. You missed it by misrepresenting them. And you missed it by looking on a fleshly, surfacy level to something so trivial as the color of their skin. You missed it. And listen to this response. Give who a what? <laughs> the unmitigated gall. I don't even know if my butt just showed, but. I the audacity. Okay. Audacity. See, they're talking about changing structures and systems. This is Marxism. And the audacity that you would pray for me and, and ask God, beseeching the Lord Jesus Christ, that, that my heart would be soft to the things of God. The, 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 the God, the audacity that you would pray that God would give me a spirit of humility. How dare you? See that? How dare you pray that I be more like Christ? How dare you? You will know them by their fruit. You will know them by their fruit. Listen. <laughs> oh. It's rough. It's rough out there in these white evangelical streets now. Man, I, wow. You talk uh, about All right, let me stop here. Special. It's rough out here in these white evangelical streets. Wow. Well, my friends, that is that. Uh, let me know what you think. Leave a comment below. This is the Proverbial Life podcast. We encourage Christians to look to Christ, live wisely, and leave a legacy behind for generations to follow. If you watch that video, please do me a favor and pray for Austin Channing Brown, and also pray for Kev on stage. Um, that's all I got to say. Um, if you would like to support the proverbial life, the information is in the description bar. Love y'all. Till next time. Grace and peace, y'all.